Um, are we there in North Ridgeville? Can you hear me there? All right. Let me turn off my phone, which I forgot to turn off so that we don't have any interruptions. Um, we're going to continue on discussing um, designing websites. And specifically, we're going to talk about the design document that you have to prepare for this class. Students, as a rule, sometimes don't <coughs> appreciate the um, importance of designing things before you go and do them. A lot of times students would prefer, um, and you know, even some, even some inexperienced, I'll say, developers prefer, well, I, I know what I need to do, I'm just going to go in and do it. Um, let me explain to you the importance of a design document, and hopefully that will convince you. And if it doesn't convince you, it doesn't matter. It still is worth so many points, so it's probably a good idea to do it. All right? A design document does a couple things. First of all, it cements your thoughts. All right? You can have a plan to do something, and you can have it in your head, but really by putting it on paper, it really sort of makes it more concrete and makes sure that you don't miss things. Um, a, a, a friend of mine had a saying, something like, faded ink is better than the best memory. In other words, if it's written down, you know to take care of it, and it's not like floating around in your head, and you're liable to forget it. So that's one reason why it's important. It's important to plan. I showed you that curve before, how the cost of making a change to any software goes up geometrically as the project proceeds. Well, it's important for us to try to catch that on the early part of the curve and try to find as many problems as we can. And you do that by thinking through them. You're not going to catch everything, but the hope is you'll catch as many of them as possible. So it's important to plan for that reason. It's important to put it in writing to sort of make it more concrete instead of just sort of these vague notions that are floating around in your head. And lastly, you might want to share your design with people. When you're creating a website, typically you're creating the website for someone, all right? And by, by giving them a document that they can sit and review, that allows you to share what's in your head with them before you get too long in the process. Now, in this particular case, I'm, the document that you create, you're turning in all at once at the end. In a more realistic situation, you might turn in piece of, pieces of it over time. In other words, the first section of it you might give to your, uh, your client and have your client look at it and tell you if it's, if it's accurate or not. And then the second piece and then the third piece. Well, in our case, we're preparing the whole design document and giving it to, to them. Now, you may, uh, in addition to the client, you may be working on a team of developers. In other words, you might not be the only person working on it. And if that's the case, it's good to have everyone on the, on the same page. So there's a number of reasons why this is important. Um, the fact that planning is critical. The fact that we want specific plans. We don't want just vague plans floating around our head. And lastly, to be able to share this. It, uh, these are all good things and all reasons why um, developing a plan I is necessary. Now, um, last time we, last couple times, or last time, I don't remember exactly when, we, we focused on goals and the goals of the organization and the goals of um, the people that are visiting the site. And then we sort of expanded that by saying um, that there isn't simply one kind of person that's going to be visiting your site. There's, there's, you, can, you can break your users into, into definite groups. And those groups may share some goals in common or they may have some distinct goals. But in any case, you don't simply create a site for a user. You plan on a set of users. Now what we're going to do today is we're going to actually look at the document that you're going to prepare in more detail starting with the stage that's called the strategy stage, and that's the stage where you define the goals. And then we'll look at the other four stages um, of the project. All right.
So let's open up this document. And let's open up my sample document. All right, this describes the five phases. The first phase being the design. And in this section, you're, first of all, you're going to have a description of your site's topic and purpose. So you're going to say, I'm going to do a website about, someone mentioned the city last time. I'm going to do a website about London or Paris or New York or Amherst Township. All right, so you're going to pick from one of those three or four cities. No, I'm just kidding. You can pick whatever city you want. So you're going to describe the, the, the purpose, the topic of your site. Keeping in mind that you want to go beyond things such as I'm going to make a site about such and such. You're going to talk about the reason that you're making the site. So if I was making a site about uh, New York, there's a number of different approaches I could take. I could take the approach of New York for people that live in New York. So a guide to restaurants in New York, up and coming restaurants in New York, or new restaurants or something like that. I could write it for someone who's visiting from out of town, so a tourist guide to New York. Or I could write it for someone coming overseas, you know, a overseas visitor to New York. All of those are slightly different flavors of the same topic. All right. Now, you could write, a, you could write a, a page that would uh, um, deal with all those issues. The point is, is in addition to defining your topic, you're going to define your target audience as well. And audience or audiences as well in this phase. So it's not enough to say that you're going to describe um, New York. You want to go in a little bit in, in more detail. We'll look at my example of this in, in a minute. You're going to have a list, a prioritized list of three of your goals for this project. And by your goals, I mean assuming that you're the organization creating the site. So you're Amherst Township's Chamber of Commerce, and you're creating the site. What are your goals in creating the site? And you'll create a prioritized list of three, and you'll create a prioritized list of three user goals that this project will address. And that's at least three. All right? You could come up with more. You will also create three user personas. Now, we'll see an example of a persona in a minute. What a persona is, is a representative person of typical groups that are going to be visiting your site. So, if I was doing a website for Lorain County Community College, one of my personas might be Mary Smith, who is um, a, a high school senior who's thinking of coming to LC um, next year. One of them might be uh, Joe Jones, who is a person that is a displaced worker and wants to go back to, to school to get some additional training, and so on. That's what I mean by persona. Finally, it should look professional. It should, look, should be done in Word, and it should read like a report that you'd give your boss. All right. Now, let's look at an example that I prepared. And I said I'm going to pretend that I'm going to do a site about jazz music. It's one of my favorite forms of music, but it's one that's not particularly popular these days, and a lot of people are very unfamiliar with it. So, boy, you're hitting that keyboard hard. Um, Sorry. That's all right. Yeah, it's distracting. Um, my goal here and my purpose is not just to make a site about jazz, but to make a site about jazz geared towards people who are not familiar with it. All right? Now, I could have taken this any number of different ways. I could have said that I wanted to make a site about jazz music for musicians. All right? That would be a totally different site than a site geared towards listeners. All right? And musicians, I might talk about instruments and saxophone reeds and all kinds of technical details. For people that are listeners, I'm going to talk about more of it in a qualitative sense, you know, in, in, in the kind of music it is and if they like this 
musician, they might like this musician, and so on. I would also talk different if I was talking to expert listeners, people who have been listening to a while versus novice listeners. You know, if I were to mention, uh, if I were doing a site for experts, I might talk about some more obscure recordings or some more obscure jazz musicians with the thought that these people are already experts. They know the basic stuff. So I don't need to talk about that. I can really focus and drill down and talk about maybe stuff that they're not aware of. All right. However, my goal is to talk to people who are not familiar um, with jazz to any great degree. So I've narrowed down the topic. Instead of simply saying I'm doing a, <clears throat> a site about jazz, I'm saying I'm doing a site uh, geared towards the novice listener. All right. Now, organizational goals. To broaden the popularity of jazz by educating people not familiar. To expand listeners' horizons by introducing them to musicians to give an overview of the whole history of jazz. Now, none of these would necessarily be a goal until I defined it. You know, I may focus only on current musicians. All right, but I decided, no, you know, for, for these people, the better thing to do is to talk about the whole history of the music. User goals. These are some of the things that a user, I would expect the user to come to the site for. And that is find other musicians similar to musicians they already like to find biographical background information about musicians and to get information that will assist them in building a jazz record library. Here are my personas then. And I actually go and get pictures of people and I give them names and I make up a little story about them. Now you might think, gee, that's kind of corny, that's kind of hokey. Why would I do that? The reason is, is we want to put a face on the people that are out there that are going to be visiting our site. We don't want to think of them just in very broad terms as the user. We want to think of them in terms of unique, distinct people who may have some overlapping goals, but each may have their own sort of goals and comes with their own sort of background. So we go and we create these little stories, all right, about them. Yes? No, these are actually people. All right, these are people that are going to be visiting the site. So if you were do doing a, a tourist, let's say you're doing a tourist site for Cleveland, all right, you might have three personas. You might have Bill, who is, lives in Columbus, so is within driving distance of Cleveland, all right, and he knows a little bit about Cleveland because, you know, he's from Ohio, but he might not know about all the great things in there because he last visited it 10 years ago. All right? You might have uh, Sue from Los Angeles who has never been to Cleveland in her life and really doesn't know hardly anything about it. Then you might have um, you know, George from the UK who's visiting Cleveland on business, works for an international company and is visiting Cleveland on business. No, in fact, these people are not celebrities. These people, I literally went to uh, this Flickr account and um, I, I picked just random people. That is not Brad Parker, all right? That is, that's just some guy. And the image is licensed. Well, the, the, whoever took the picture licensed it under Creative Commons, so I do have copyright permission to do that. This guy doesn't realize that, you know, he's, he's now a celebrity, you know? Um, it, it would be funny to run into one of these people's one of these days. It would be like, I know you from somewhere, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but yeah, no, these are actually just people I, that I, I did a search on Flickr for Creative Commons. And I think I talked about Creative Commons in this class. Yeah. yeah. And, and I just did that. So you can substitute pictures of your friends, pictures of your enemies, uh, pictures that you have, the Creative Commons pictures, pictures that you take from a site and do that. Yes. Uh-huh. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah.
Yeah, well, well, again, that was my example. You might have three different kinds of, you know, you could pick, you know, just to show you the, the different directions you could go with that, you could pick a single person that's visiting it, you could pick a family that's visiting it, and you could pick a professional that's there on business or something like that. So it doesn't have to be the categories I had. The idea of this is to get you thinking about who your target audience is and to, to start thinking about the fact that different people visiting your site are going to have different reasons for visiting. You know, so um, instead of thinking of a target audience, thinking of three sort of subsets of that audience. Here is Mary Nelson taking a music appreciation class at a community college. She knows almost nothing about jazz, but she does enjoy some of the music played in class. And finally, here is Bob Jones, has a few friends that listen to jazz music. So I made up little stories about them. You know, it doesn't have to be great novels. You, know, you don't have to go and talk about their history and how they, they grew up in, the, in Chicago and their their dad was a struggling musician and, and all that. You don't have to do anything like that. You can, you can if you want to, I suppose. Although, although I would say that would probably be better in a creative writing class. All right. But the idea is, is you focus on their distinct needs and, and how you might be able to gear your website a little bit differently for that group of people as opposed to just the general user out there. The whole idea of this is targeting. What's the first rule of any communication, whether you're talking about a writing or speech, almost any class that deals with communication, the first rule they say is, pardon me? Yeah, targeting or know your audience. All right? Now, in this case, what I'm saying is we want to do a little better than just knowing our audience. We want to know a little bit about the different audiences that are going to be accessing the site. All right, so that is the strategy section. That is where, to summarize, we define the goals of the maker of the site, and I'll call them site goals, and we define user goals, and we define three personas which are representative of the typical user groups. And we write up a little summary that talks about the site's purpose. That is the strategy section. So when we're done with the strategy section, this is what we have. The next phase is the requirements phase. Yeah. All right. Hmm. All right. I think I bumped it with my arm as I reached over there. Requirements, in other words, for requirements is scope. The scope section is pretty easy, really, in some regard. You've defined what your goals are. Now what you're going to do is you're going to talk about what you're going to do to try to achieve those goals. Even in business, they talk about the strategy that you have and the tactics that you're going to go to achieve that. Your strategy might be to, you know, to, to sell your product to a new group of people. You know, um, that might be one uh, example of it. You know. The tactics you take might be to give out free samples somewhere. All right. It might be to print coupons in the paper, all right, and so on. So if you think about marketing, you know, you have a strategy, and the, but, but any strategy you take can be implemented several different ways. 
So you have your strategy and then you have the tactics that you're taking. In the goal section, in the strategy section, we define the strategy we have for the site. Now we're going to look at what we're going to do to achieve those goals. So we're coming up with the tactics or the requirements. All right. Now, a few things to keep in mind, that neither the tactics nor the goals should be things that simply restate basic web design. In other words, you shouldn't say that a goal of the site is to have a good navigation. Yeah, that's assumed, right? Now, there might be rare exceptions under which you don't have a uh, good navigation, you know, for reasons like, you know, a game or whatever. But for the most part, it's pretty safe to say that the sites that you guys are going to be doing, good navigation is a goal. So you don't need to document it. The goals and the tactics are specific to your site's content. So I'm not going to talk about the colors should be pleasing. I'm not going to talk about the navigation should be good. I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about the font needs to be readable. I'm going to talk about what specific content about my topic I'm going to put on the site to achieve my goals. All right? For example, let's say I was doing a website for a band. All right? One of the goals for the creators of the site might be to gain new listeners. All right? Now, what are some ways that a band could gain some new listeners? What are some things that a band could put on their website that would help them gain new listeners? Uh, audio an audio track. Now, a whole audio track or a sample of an audio track? Maybe a sample, maybe one whole track, right? The band has the goal of getting people to listen to and liking their music. Users have the goal of discovering new music and maybe even getting some for free, right? So you could possibly put a track from a recording available for download. Or you could put samples from several tracks. What's another way that a band could possibly get um, attract new listeners in addition to putting samples of their music? Well, it's similar to but they could put videos, perhaps, videos of their appearances. They could put schedules of where they're going to, where they're going to appear. All right. They could put reviews that have been published about them. Maybe if they've had a recording out, maybe magazines and newspapers have reviewed it and given that. They could possibly put interviews with the band on the site. All these things are things that they could put on the site with the goal in mind to attract new listeners. Which do they do? Well, it depends. It depends on what? It depends on what they think, which, which tactics do they think will work best with the target audience. All right? For example, um, if a band is, you know, geared towards younger kids, let's say, some younger kids really get into bands and want to know what the band members had for breakfast and, and see pictures of them playing volleyball and all kinds of stuff that maybe an older listener um, wouldn't really care much about, you know. Um, I'm thinking, you know, people that would like a band like, say, One Direction. You know, they would go crazy about any mention of that band. And a strategy you'd take with them would be different than someone that was older and listened to classical music. You know, I don't care what particular things they had for breakfast if I were listening to uh, classical music. So you have to look at your personas. You have to look at your users to choose between the different tactics you could take. So you can take any number of different tactics to achieve your goal. All right? But your users and your personas will help you decide what would work best in your particular case. All right? And that's how you select the things that you're going to do on your site. Now, you might say, 
why not do everything? If there's 10 different things I could do to attract new listeners, why not do all 10 of them? What's wrong with that? Overwhelming, Overwhelming and cluttered. All right? It, um, it, would, it, would, uh, it would possibly serve to distract the users from the stuff that is going to be very effective in developing the, the site. So your job is to choose wisely. You have a list of goals, at least six of them in our example. You need to pick specific pieces of content that will help you satisfy all those goals. Now, and you, might, you have to pick what you think will most effectively solve those, those goals or, or help satisfy those goals. So, one thing that you should be able to do when you're done is match up the goals with the requirements. All right? In other words, if I define six goals for my site, three of mine, three of my users, I better have at least some requirements that matches up with each of my goals. So for example, if one of my goals is to say, I'm going to, um, I'm going to promote my band's concerts appearances on, on my site. If I don't have anything like a schedule of concerts or um, things, something such as that on my site, then I haven't done anything on my site to help me achieve my goal. So for every goal you have, there should be at least one requirement that matches up to it. And you should be able to just draw a line or put the letters next to it. You know? Likewise, for every requirement should match up with one of the goals. Why is that? Well, if it's something that isn't necessary, then why have it on your site? If you, don't, if, if you didn't define something as one of your top goals, you know, then why bother putting it on your site? All right? So, between the goals and the requirements, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship because one goal can be serviced by several different requirements and one requirement can help to achieve several different goals. But there should be complete coverage in both directions. One goal should at least have one requirement. Every requirement should relate to at least one goal. All right? It's good if you word these requirements as precisely as possible. I say see the Garrett book for some good examples. The Garrett book used to be one of the textbooks in this class. It is not any longer. Um, but I have provided an example here. If you're really interested, there is a, a real good thin book that's called The Element of User Experience by a guy named Jesse James Garrett. And um, it, is, it is a good book. And it was formerly used as a textbook in this class. Requirement list should be fairly detailed, fairly comprehensive. How much is enough? And I go through this. 15 to 20 well-worded, detailed requirements. On the flip side, don't bite off more than you can chew. What you're leaving out is sometimes as important as what you put in. Remember, we don't want, you know, it's not the case that, you know, more is always better. More can be overkill and more can overwhelm the user and more can make it difficult for users to find what's truly important to them. It's okay to change the requirements as you're doing the project. Remember, this is a plan. So when you plan something, once you start to create it, you might get better ideas. And it's okay to go and change it. But you're still better off to start with a plan. It's like, for example, I had a plan to drive to the art museum yesterday. All right? I, I knew what roads I was going to take and all that. Now, when I got 
close to there, there was some sort of bicycle race or something going on. So I had to change my plan. I couldn't go the, the direction that I wanted to. So I had to go and I had to make some modifications uh, to it. Now, that's okay. Things come up. Sometimes you think of better ideas of how to handle something. But the idea is, is it's better to start with a plan and sort of know how to get there, even though you know that, gee, circumstances may force me to change it at some point. Then to just go and say, I'm going to the art museum. It must be somewhere in Cleveland. Let me drive that. Let me drive east and hope that I find it. All right. Here are the examples of the requirements on my particular one. My site will have biography of both contemporary musicians and musicians of the past. Now already we can look and we can see that serves a couple of different goals. Right? There's a user goal to find out biographical information. And one of my goals is to overview the whole history. So this requirement actually addresses two of my goals. And I put those letters next to this, like I put O3 and U2. I was going to do this, but I got a little lazy. You could actually go and put those letters next to it. In other words, this addresses goal O2 and U2. All right, or whatever. I then go and I kind of put all these goals together, or, or um, I'm sorry, all these requirements together uh, to form a list of requirements. Each biography is going to consist of, and so far down the line. Spelling error, not very professional, minus one. We have a page for each of the main instruments to be used. On each page, the biographicals will be arranged chronologically. And so on down the line. So the idea is, is when I've finished defining all this list, I can pair up and I can see every goal has at least one requirement and every requirement goes to one goal. All right? So that's the requirement phase. If you notice, we're starting off very broadly by talking about the goals that we're trying to achieve. Now we're getting into more specifics about, OK, we've defined these goals. What are we going to do to achieve those goals? And we're actually getting and we're zeroing in on actually making web pages. But we're not jumping in and just making web pages to start. All right, we're planning them and thinking them out. The next thing to do is to come up with a structure for the site. What do I mean by the structure? I mean how you're going to group and organize your materials together. All right? I should have had one of those when my hip was broken. That would have been, that would have been neat. Of course, maybe I would have broken my other hip then, and that wouldn't have been good. Um, the structure says how I'm going to organize my site. Now, any topic you could organize a bunch of different ways. All right. What are some ways I could organize my topic of jazz music? Go ahead. Uh huh. Okay. I could organize it by time. So I could do something like this. I could have. My home page, and talk about the past, present, and future. So maybe in the future I'd talk about, you know, up and coming musicians, you know, and, and people who haven't really um, done their best work yet or whatever. 
That's a very reasonable way to organize this. What's another way I could organize this? Geography. Geography. Excellent. There is in jazz music different styles that are identifiable by the region. They talk about, you know, New Orleans. New York, of course, is always a big one. There's a Kansas City style. A Chicago style. There's any number of great European musicians, and so on down the line. That's also a very reasonable, logical way to organize the site. All right? We could probably think of more ways. I could organize it maybe uh, alphabetical, have all my biographies listed from A to Z. All right? That might be a reasonable way to do it. I, however, have chosen to organize my site as based on the instrument that the people played. And so on. Why did I do that? Well, So that's my structure chart. Most of you, your structure charts will look like this. Sometimes structure charts can get more and more involved, right? You can have things underneath things and branches out and all that. But our sites that we're going to do are small enough that most of your site's structure is going to look like this. Now, I'm using what's called an organizing principle of musical instrument. The organizing principle is like how you're di di dividing the stuff and organizing the stuff. So, in this case, we had chronological in the first example that a student gave, geographical the second one. This is based on musical instrument. And here's why I chose that. I chose that because I thought that would be the most obvious to a new listener. All right. In other words, until you've listened to the music for a while, it might not be obvious what the Kansas City style means. Maybe experts or people that have, have some familiarity with it would know. Likewise, with, with, with chronological, there's some musicians today in their 80s that are still playing and making good work. Do you put them under current or do you put them in the past? That's hard to say. And what about people that maybe have been around a little while, uh, but we expect them to have a bright future? Do you put them in the current or do you put them in the future? I don't know. It, it, it's hard to say. I'm not saying you couldn't make it work, but in my mind, it was more straightforward to say, gee, I like listening to piano players play. Let me go and let me find some piano players play. Or I listen to, um, you know, I listen to Sonny Rollins in school, that he's a saxophone player. I liked it. Maybe I'll look up some other saxophone players. Maybe I'll find some saxophone players that play like him, or people that he he influenced, or people that influenced him. What other? Well, you you could do that by here. I'm grouping them by instrument. So I would have, I wouldn't have, I would have all saxophonists, regardless if they were old timers or young guys, I'd have them all on the same page. The point of this is, think about how you're going to organize the material. Because really, how you organize the material is a big part of making your navigation simple. All right? Making your navigation simple isn't just about making pretty links or links that stand out or something like that. That's, a, that's a, an important part of it. But organizing your stuff well in the first place is what leads to good, effective navigation. All right? So, 
Think about how you're going to navigate, uh, I'm sorry, think about how you're going to organize all those requirements, all those things that you said you were going to do, where are you going to put them? How are you going to break them down? Obviously, you're not going to have one page that has everything on your entire site. Likewise, you're not going to have necessarily a separate page for each of your requirements. But what you're going to do is you're going to take that information and decide how you're going to subdivide it and how you're going to group it and categorize it. And in that way, you will come up with your site structure. So when you're done with the site structure, this is what it's going to look like. Along with that, you have a little explanation of the other options that you considered. All right? I've had many people tell me, well, I don't know, I can't think of another way to organize this material. I'll bet if you try, you can. Or if we talk about it, you can. Because almost any topic you could divide several different ways. Let's talk about the city topic. What are some ways that we could group the information on that site, the city topic? OK, history of the city? Population. Population. OK. OK. So that's sort of a topical categorization of it. In other words, you, you take the city, and then you have a list of subtopics underneath that. What's another way that you could group the material? on that. Um, it's a reasonable way. Again, um, I, I just want to make sure that we consider other options. Right. Okay. Right. 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 We could, we could uh, look at what our goals are and maybe pick a, a subtopic of that. Um, the one thing I'm talking, uh, the one thing I'm thinking of is we could make it purely chronological. So we could have New York, you know, up to 1700. New York, 1700 to, uh, you know, 1900. We could do it that way. All right, purely chronological. Another way we could do it, if you think of New York or even Cleveland, is you could break it down by neighborhood. The Tremont area, the Ohio City area, the downtown Cleveland, uh, and so on. All right? So you could break it down, or like in New York, they have the, the, what, seven boroughs, five boroughs? I don't know. Yeah, you know, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, Queens, and so on. We could break it down that way. Now, the thing with that is, I, my brother lives in New York, and all the time he's talking about such and such being in Queens and all that, I have no clue what that means. I've been in New York once or twice, but I couldn't tell you, like, where is Queens or whatever. So again, if you were doing a site for New Yorkers, talking it by, by borough would probably be a good idea, because they understand that. Whereas if you're doing it for outsiders, we don't know anything about that. It's all New York to us, right, exactly. So, um, and again, yeah, I mean, my brother will even say, you know, I will say my brother's from New York. He'll say, I'm from Brooklyn, you know, because they identify very closely with the region uh, that they're in. All right, so the point is, is you look at your audience and you decide what kind of organization is going to fit best for them. All right? The, third, the, the next to last phase is what's called the skeleton, where you create what are called wireframes. Wire, and there's a description of this in here that you can read as well. Wireframes is where, you're, where you sketch out like a template. So if you look at almost any site, let's look at Angel. There's a heading. There's a navigation. There's a sub-navigation. And then there's the content. 
Almost every page that we look at here fits that mold. So this whole site, even though there's a million different pages on this site, has one wireframe. The heading, the navigation, sub-navigation, and then the content area. And this content area is what changes from page to page. You will not necessarily have one wireframe per page. In fact, you probably won't. For a small project like we're doing, you probably will have one or maybe two wireframes. Because remember, you want your site to have a consistent look. So in the wireframe section, you specify the general basic layout without going into the details of specifically what's there. So in this case, I'm not saying what's going to be in the heading. I'm not saying what's in the navigation and the sub-navigation. That comes later. All right? But I am just saying that I'm going to have this heading, I'm going to have a navigation, and I'm going to have a sub-navigation and then a content area. Uh -huh. um, we, will, we will talk about that, yeah. Uh, and, and anything that we don't talk about, that you want to talk about, we can, we can talk about it individually. And, and that's, a, that's a good question that, that uh, a student had here. Um, what about, you know, based on what we know now, you might, you might have an idea of developing a site but you don't know how to code it right at this minute. Don't worry about that. It'll come. And if it doesn't come, I can work with you individually to, to get it. If there's something in particular that we don't talk about in class that you're interested in doing, we can do it. So you kind of almost have to have a little bit of faith that by the time you get to actually writing it, there'll be enough. And with your design, if you go overboard and specify something that we simply aren't going to talk about at all, and you're, you're making it way, uh, you know, a way massive uh, uh, thing, then I'll tell you, and, and we can work on scaling it down. The very last step is a prototype. And we will not do a prototype in this example, because all a prototype is is essentially making rough drafts of your page. It's taking that template, that wireframe, and actually making um, actual web pages that implement that template. And that's where we're going to pick up on Wednesday. We'll start talking about doing exactly what you said, taking that wireframe and making an actual web page from it. All right? Um, and we'll spend a pretty good amount of time taking that and, and um, doing it. If you look one last thing in the documents, here is the rubric, rubric, which is a grading scale. And you can see that I think actually there's a, there's a mistake in this. It's, it's based off of 20 points, and, and this is only off of 15 points. But you can sort of scale it down that the strategy section <laughs> be an overachiever, exactly. Um, you know, if it's complete and clear, you'll get the full credit on it. If you're missing something, and if it's missing, of course, or unprofessional, you get zero points. All right, what we'll do next time is we'll start taking this wireframe, our basic design, and start making a prototype. And we'll start talking about how to take a page and turn it into, you know, how to take a template like this and turn it into a complete collection of pages. Any questions for anyone? You okay in Ridgeville? All right. I have a question. Once I have a website, yes. what do we need to do in order to put on the internet? Okay, that's a great question. Once you have a website, uh, what to do to put on the internet? Uh, we can talk about that. Uh, if you remind me Wednesday, I can start the discussion talking about that because that's, that's a great question. Okay. All right. Thanks.